Hey everyone, it's Marvin. Thanks so much for listening to Books and Boba. Uh, I just wanted to take a quick second to remind you that Books and Boba just launched our Patreon uh, to help support our future endeavors. Rira and I have been running Books and Boba for the last six and a half years, and we've always talked about wanting to do more, um, including expanding our content offerings, um, being able to go to book events and do more coverage. And so um, to help us get closer to those ambitions, um, we started a Patreon to help us grow and to better support books by Asian and Asian American authors. We are offering two tiers for our Patreon. Um, the first is our regular Boba member coming in at $3 a month, which will give you access to our brand new Books and Boba Discord server so you can engage with your fellow Books and Boba Club members and also Rira and myself in real time. Uh, this is where we'll be aiming to move the bulk of our book club discussions. Uh, but rest assured, we'll still have a presence on Goodreads as well. And our premium tier is our Honey Boba member tier coming in at $5 dollars a month where in addition to access to our discord server you'll also get access to our monthly boba chats a bonus podcast where rira and i and some guests will get together each month and have a a more casual discussion on stuff that may or may not be book related as well as answer some listener q a honey boba members will also have access to a poll to help decide an official books and boba book pick uh, once per quarter so if any of that sounds interesting to you, um, support Books and Boba on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash books and boba. As always, we and I really appreciate your support. All right. Thanks for listening. And I'm on with the show. You're listening to Whoa. Hot Luck. Hot Luck. to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Nathalie. And I'm Rira Yu. And on this episode of Books and Boba, we have a very special author interview for you. Uh, we are chatting with author Jesse Q. Sutanto, the author of Dial A for Aunties, The Obsession, and a lot more books coming down the pipe. Rira, we had a really great conversation with Jesse, didn't we? Yeah, I was really excited to talk about this book, um, especially when we announced the book deal. We're like <laughs> crazy rich Asians with uh, Weekend with Bernie's. Like, yeah, this sounds like a fun <laughs> comedy romp. And I wonder how this is going to work. <laughs> how do you yeah. have a dead body at a, at a at like a rich, spectacular wedding? I would like to know. So I'm really glad that we got a chance to read the book. Uh, you and I both loved it. Uh, we had a lot of fun talking about it with Jesse and <laughs> uh, talking about your trauma with auntie. Yeah. And your love of murder fiction. Uh, yeah, I love murder so much. <laughs> Count how many times I say I love murder on uh, in this episode because... It yeah. comes up quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So um, before we get to our interview with Jesse, um, uh, Rira, what is Dial A for Aunties all about? So Dial A for Aunties is a quirky novel, to say the least, uh, that is equal parts murder, mystery, and rom-com. And it's about Madeline Chan, who is a wedding photographer at her family's uh, wedding agency, I guess. Uh, she has three aunts and her mother. And um, one day, Madeline ends up accidentally killing her blind date. And she calls her aunties to help her uh, get rid of the body. But unfortunately, the body gets accidentally shipped in a cake cooler to the over-the-top billionaire wedding that Medi and her aunts and her mom are working. Uh, and it's at like this private island resort on the California coastline. So it's a very big deal. And they have a body that they have to get rid of. So shenanigans happen. It's very funny. Um, Lots of hijinks yeah. in this one. Lots of hijinks. <laughs> and we chat with Jesse about all of that. So uh, without further ado, here is our interview with Jesse Q. Sutanto. And we're here with Jesse Q. Sutanto, the author of Dial A for Aunties, as well as The Obsession. Uh, welcome, Jesse. We're so excited to have you here on the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. 
Yeah. Um, full disclosure, we've been trying to make this interview happen for months, I feel like. Because <laughs> Jesse's calling in from, are you in Singapore now or Jakarta? I'm in Indonesia. Okay. Yeah, I'm in Jakarta. Okay. Yeah. So time zones are a thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, so just starting off, uh, Jesse, can you tell us a little bit about when you wanted to become a writer? Like, was writing always something that was part of your life? Um, I heard that it took you like eight manuscripts to get published. Like it was a very long journey yeah. for you. So if you could expand a little bit on that. Uh, on my never ending um, saga. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've always loved writing and books. And so I think it was around like 10 years ago now, actually longer than that. Uh, I was like, oh, I'm going to get a master's in creative writing. And my parents were like, oh, you should go to business school. And I was like, I'm going to go get my creative writing degree. And they were like, Ugh. so, but they supported me anyway, because they're wonderful. And, and so I did that. And then it took a heck of a long time um, after graduating to, you know, to even get like, one book published so that was that was a really long and twisty journey with lots and lots of rejections and um, for the longest time I was kind of trying to find my voice and I think around uh, at that time we didn't really have like that diverse uh, you know push for more diversity in books so uh, I was writing I was I didn't think that, you know, publishing would want stories from uh, people like me. And so for the longest time, I was just kind of writing like Caucasian characters and and stuff like that. So, so I'm very grateful for, for all the authors, you know, who have kind of paved the way for us. All right, that was such a derail. <laughs> I mean, you went from all that time to get your first book published to what? six books in the next three years plus a netflix deal yeah um well actually it's it's eight books eight? <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> uh yeah i i think it's uh you know kind of just i'm so grateful actually that it took me so long to get published because it it gave me time to learn how to write quickly and not keep second guessing myself and so now I I have learned how to like come out with you know a completed first draft in under two months oh my so, god that yeah. is that is insane <laughs> yeah and I don't think I would have learned how to do that if I had like for example my first book had gotten published you know then I would have just kind of gone along with like the usual publishing schedule but now um, I have that. And then I have my parents who are constantly like, well, that's good. But when are you going to sell your next book? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they make for really great motivation. Wow. Yeah, that that sounds super Asian of like, what's what's your next <laughs> step? What's your like moving the yeah. goalpost for for sure? Oh, my gosh. All the time. I mean, like. So I follow you on Instagram and on Twitter. So I've been seeing all of your uh, hilarious comedy sketches about uh, <laughs> Dow A for aunties. Um, let me just say you have like the fashion down for the for the aunties for each auntie because there are four aunties and you have very four distinct outfits for each auntie. And I was just like, wow, Jesse is hilarious. This book is hilarious. They're uh, all my mom's <laughs> outfits. Oh my god! <laughs> so you just stole them from um, from her closet, or did you say, hey, mom, like I'm doing like a sketch on? Uh, on TikTok, can I borrow some of your clothes? <laughs> it was um, I I would just be like, I'm gonna borrow your clothes, and she's like, Oh, finally, you you know, you're gonna dress well. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, and then and then she saw the videos, and she was like, Ah, that's why you wanted the clothes. <laughs> They she didn't she didn't say like how good you looked in them or anything. 
<laughs> she was just she she was laughing so hard and uh one of the videos uh, I posted and she said like she was going through she was having a really tough day and you know she was she was really grumpy and then she saw it and she said like she started laughing <laughs> and she was like oh I was I was trying to feel grumpy and <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing so that was nice uh, so your YA book, The Obsession, uh, that also has accidental murder in it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and this seems to be a, a plot point that you seem to enjoy writing. So uh, can I just ask, yeah. like, is that one of your favorite tropes, I guess? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it is totally my favorite trope because I love writing about good uh, I, I don't know if my characters are good. Um, like normal people, uh, kind of being shoved into, you know, really bad situations and seeing how they would react. I, I kind of feel like it's such a great catalyst. Yeah, murder uh, is a and, pretty and it's really good funny catalyst. That you brought up the obsession, actually, because. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, speaking of the obsession, my my mom disapproves of it. So <laughs> just to put it out there, it does not have her stamp of approval. <laughs> I mean, that's even funnier because it's a YA book, and it's like, oh, people younger yeah. than uh, younger than you are reading this, and it has murder in it. Yeah. <laughs> How does she feel yeah. about Dolly Do- Do- <laughs> for aunties? Uh, she she loved it, but she was like. But, you know, these, uh, the aunties are not like me and my sisters. And she was saying, like, you know, your big aunt is not like this. Your second aunt is not like this. And then I told her, like, well, yeah, I had to kind of scramble um, their personalities so that nobody would recognize themselves. And then I told her, like, so big aunt is actually, um, you know, a little bit more based on this other person. And she was like, oh, my God. Now I see it. <laughs> so um, she had to kind of guess like who was based on whom after that. And she got all of them wrong. Oh. <laughs> I, did a good job. I mean, I got to say, um, reading this book was um, very triggering for me as someone who does live with an aunt <laughs> who does embody multiple characteristics of the aunties you, uh, you featured. And I feel like I I told you this before we started recording, but I just had one of those fights with my aunt earlier this week. So I was like, oh, (laughs) I I think a lot of people, especially like Asian Americans who are in that situation, will have a lot to relate to. And I mean, I've been telling this Mm -hmm. to my friends who are interested in reading the book. It's like, don't expect any like catharsis with the aunties. This is not this is not a story (laughs) about having the aunties come around to your point of view, because as we know in real life, that does not happen. (laughs) The aunties are just a part mm-hmm. of the story and like a catalyst for the hijinks and just, <laughs> just accept the aunties. Yeah, it's a story about acceptance uh, <laughs> that, you know, you you will never have victory over the aunties. <laughs> so I'm guessing that you have a pretty large family yourself, right, uh, Jesse? Yeah, I, I do. I have a huge family. My My dad has six siblings and my mom has eight and um I think I have like over 40 first cousins and and we're yeah we're always being compared you know to one another as we were like growing up and and everyone is like so close to everyone and of course everyone knows everyone and yeah (laughs) there's so much drama I mean, it's a blessing and a curse, right? Because um, you're surrounded by so much love and you you know that your family has your back uh, and they will help you uh, bury a body if need be. Mm -hmm. Um, But also you're everyone knows each other and there are no secrets. And yeah, Yeah. definitely. It's it's a struggle that a lot of um, not just Asian Americans, but I guess Mm -hmm. just um, Asians who are in between, I guess, like, like Mm -hmm. between tradition and also Mm -hmm. trying to find independence. Those are uh, two things that always seem to be at odds with each other. But what I really liked about your book was that you didn't make one better than the other, like being 
um, mm-hmm. loyal to your family wasn't a bad trait. Like there are mm-hmm. some negative traits, obviously, <laughs> to to having nosy aunties, but there's also a lot of positive traits, yeah. and I really appreciated that. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that actually kind of happened uh, in real life uh, with my husband because my husband is English, and for a while we were actually living in England away from my family, and um, and then we kind of made the decision, you know, like, okay, let's try living in Jakarta (laughs) in the thick of it on the same street uh, as like all of my aunts and uncles and my parents living like literally two doors away from us. That's how you do it. And, um, and now like, (laughs) yeah. And, you know, sometimes I'm like having a bad day and I'm like, oh, we're going to move back to England. This is it. And my husband's <laughs> like, actually, I kind of prefer it here, you know, like, yeah, better food. Our kids, um, you know, yeah, like uh, having all this, uh, you know, noise and family around them. Like, uh, so, so it's, it's really, it's really nice to see that, like, oh, okay, you know, sometimes those family ties and like the the weight and burden of a huge family is actually a good thing well like i i feel like with with girls especially with women Mm -hmm. in big asian households the the responsibility to be Mm -hmm. filial to your parents and to your aunts and uncles it's it's huge and if you're like the eldest daughter or granddaughter it's (laughs) It's even Mm -hmm. more responsibility. And I've noticed that in the book, um, like, Mehdi's cousins, who are all boys, they're like, Mm -hmm. I'm going to move out. I'm going to move to New York. I'm never looking back. You need to, like, set yourself free after after you, like, get into college. And she's like, no, actually, you know, I'm Mm going to stay behind because my mom and my aunts need Mm -hmm. me. And um, there's this extra pressure to to stay. And Mm -hmm. I feel like that is such a I don't know. It's it's such a gender norm for a lot of Asian communities, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting because um, we used to be very traditional, like the Chinese Indonesian community used to be like, you know, oh, boys, boys, like we, we want, you know, a son, we need a son, blah, blah. But actually, I've noticed that um, with my generation and, and kind of the previous generation, they're like, oh, we really want daughters, because <laughs> they're the ones who will like, stay and look after us. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, yay. <laughs> Lucky us. <laughs> yeah. I really enjoyed that. Um, so the story, or the story doesn't take place in San Gabriel, but the, the family of Mehdi, your main character, and her aunties live in San Gabriel. And that's the that's actually my hometown. I, I was like, I I went to high school there. Oh, I grew up okay. there. So it was really, like, I felt very represented in, um, in that first Aww. chapter. I was surprised too, because Marvin started reading the book before I did. And he was like, hey, did you know that this is like set in America? Like it's set in California. And I was like, what? I thought this was going to be set in Indonesia. I don't know why that was in my head, but okay. So yeah, it was very surprising for me. (laughs) Yeah, um, I was going to ask like if you ever went to um, Top Island Dim Sum, because that that was actually where I was setting the the Dim Sum scenes. I I do know Top Island. (laughs) It's not my family's preferred dim sum place. Um, you know, every family do has... Do they prefer like triple eight? <laughs> no, we like quinoa in Alhambra, but that place just shut down because of COVID. So... Oh, no. Yeah, we need a, we need a new place, actually. <laughs> oh, But I do know wow. Top Island. Now that you mentioned it, I yeah. can now visualize where that, um, yeah. that dim sum scene took place. <laughs> yeah, I love Top Island. They have like the best buns. <laughs> What's your go-to uh, dim sum uh, entree, I guess, for both of you? Because I'm not much of a dim sum person, so I'm curious. Uh, hmm. My my family's go-to is like the shumai and hakao. Um, but I really love the, like all the buns, like the um, barbecue pork buns and the um, custard buns. And nowadays they have like the salted cake yolk buns. Oh my gosh, I love those. 
<laughs> yeah, my go-to is always the the turnip cakes. I love the pan-fried turnip cakes. Oh yeah, yeah. And then um, mm-hmm. barbecue buns. I like the steam version, not the fried version. Well, yeah. this talk became <laughs> super Asian in like a couple <laughs> seconds. <laughs> this is like um, if Koreans talk about like their favorite panchan or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, man, no, man. Because like, because like with Panchan, they just give you everything. You don't have a choice. It's just you have a little bit of everything. Uh, um, but yeah, like going back to the setting, um, like it's set in America. But did did you go to? Uh, did you like live here at one point, or was it like I'm just going to set this in America? I've never lived here before. Why not? Uh. <laughs> Uh, no, I, I did spend a lot of time there, and I I was actually dating someone who went to UCLA, and and so I was like, ah, where should they go to college? And I was like, ah, UCLA, yeah, because I I know all the the hangouts. <laughs> <laughs> but then, um, yeah, the the actual story itself like took place on an island, um. And I was like, I'm going to make this island very, like, Bali-like. Um, so that was actually a little bit of a, a cheat for me. <laughs> I mean, your book has two things that I absolutely love in stories. And it's, one, big weddings, big, fancy, rich weddings. Uh, mm-hmm. And the other one is murder. Uh, those are two <laughs> things that I absolutely <laughs> love to read. I so totally did not see that second thing coming. I thought you were going to be like, and food. Or no, no. Or something lovely. No, I, I love murder. Uh, Marvin can attest to this. I've... <laughs> It's true. M- murder, murder mysteries are usually like my go-to genre. I watch a lot of crime documentaries mm-hmm. for like bedtime yeah. stuff. And I feel like a third mm-hmm. of the book club picks that we've had have been murder mysteries. Um, yeah, because oh, nice. the the power rests in me, and when it comes to choosing yeah. books, so Who knew Asians uh, oh wrote gosh. so many murder mysteries. Um, yeah, but this is my first time reading a murder book that <laughs> was so funny, though. I, like. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, like, um, you seem to be an expert at surprising people because like, I came into this book thinking, oh, maybe it's like a murder mystery where you kind of figure out who really killed this guy. But no, the guy. <laughs> it's a it's a book about how to hide that she killed this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we we totally didn't know how you know what genre we were gonna submit it as uh, when my agent was like submitting it to publishers. And um, then she submitted it as Jane the Virgin, but Asian. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> that's a pitch right there. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I like I found really funny was um, Medi's mom uses a dating app to like catfish a potential, uh, I guess, uh-huh. future husband and that ends up being the victim in yeah. <laughs> in the book. And I just like I just thought about how the idea of an Asian parent posing as their child to like mm-hmm. get their child to date was like such a relatable and realistic thing <laughs> that could actually happen. Oh my uh, god, I know. <laughs> oh, was that something um, that actually happened or um not not quite to like that um extent but there i just know of so many uh you know like asian parents meddling in the dating lives of their kids like um where you know my cousins or or actually me at one point we you know i i was like invited to a dinner with you know with like my other cousin and then when i arrived of course there was like some some guy there who who had apparently they just ran into randomly and they're like oh this is like my old friend and then and then my cousin and her friend would have to like leave um (laughs) like halfway through and then leave me with this guy and then later I would I would find out that like oh actually the guy wasn't like my cousin's friend it was you know my my parents friend's (laughs) son or whatever (laughs) Oh God! So yeah, there's just a lot of things like that. Yeah, I, I've escaped that aspect of being a child of, of Chinese parents, but I want to say, like, 
again, like the trigger warning I give to all of my friends is that if you <laughs> if you're experienced with aunties, this book will will tickle you in ways you where a book has never tickled you before. Because I mean, all the encounters with the aunties, like the fights and the the blame shifting ninjutsu that they do, is all just so mm-hmm. it's just so real. And I guess my question is: these um those fights were they drawn from personal mm-hmm. experience or from mm-hmm. stories from other people? Oh no, they were totally like from my family um, <laughs> because like it, it would just be like a Tuesday or whatever, and then my and then my I would be like you know oh um you know do you want to like call um third aunt or whatever you know and and invite her for a dinner and then suddenly my parents are like oh we're not talking to third aunt <laughs> <laughs> so it's like always um shifting you know like the the alliances is always shifting and there's always like some disagreement and my both of my parents they they both have like family companies so uh the companies are are like kind of shared between them and their siblings so there's a lot of like you know fights uh and and everything and then and then later on like they get resolved and they're like wow you did that so well and I'm like oh thank you thank you <laughs> so yeah yeah totally totally drawn from from my 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 own family I gotta say, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen a, like, a, a lot of times when you see aunties in media, like books or TV, they're always just so cartoonish. But, like, even if the aunties in this book are cartoonish, there's there's so much mm-hmm. just authenticity in that cartoonishness because, um, yeah, it's <laughs> well done, <laughs> I'll, I'll say. <laughs> yeah, you know what's been really amazing is hearing from people from uh, all the all, all of like the many different cultures. Like I've been hearing from um, Indian readers, uh, Jewish readers, <laughs> uh, Trinidadian readers uh, who are like, oh my God, like how have you written a book about my aunties? <laughs> <laughs> so that's actually been really, really nice. Yeah. And I love that you portray them also as like real people. I, I was really moved actually by the foreword in your book where you mentioned about like how having struggle with language does not mean you're not smart. It's just a, a sign mm-hmm. of like the sacrifice that people have made to make a life. And I think, you know, a lot of times, especially because the world is so like English and American centered. Yeah. Like when someone can't speak English, well, the mm-hmm. gut reaction is, oh, this person is not intelligent. That's that's not the case. Like intelligence yeah. is not linked to fluency, right? It's like the same way. Like when I'm in Japan, yeah. I feel like a total dumb dumb because I can't you know, yeah, communicate yeah. what I want to say to people, right? So mm-hmm. I think, you know, I, I really enjoyed that, you know, you also imbued your these aunties with, like, such strong and, like, cunning, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think cunning is, like, such a great word to, <laughs> to describe, like, Asian aunties. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, yeah, the language part was very important to me because, like, I always saw my parents as, really smart and very savvy but then um when when we visited like america you know i kind of saw a shift in like how people would react to them and i remember that like feeling of oh you know oh no like why are you why are you treating them that way you know they're actually really smart it's just that it takes them a second to uh work out what to say in english and stuff like that so yeah it's always been something that's close to my heart yeah I really like how there is code switching in your book Mm -hmm. um especially when like they're trying to like hide the body or like (laughs) switch switch to Mandarin (laughs) switch to Indonesian and that's definitely something that we we do as like as Asians Mm -hmm. like we when we want like no one to hear what we're saying we're like okay switch Mm -hmm. to switch to the mother tongue so that the white (laughs) people can understand yeah Um, yeah like that that's such like a like an asian trait i and i just like absolutely loved it and just like the line where i think it was medi's mom who said oh i wasted so much money on like your chinese school like (laughs) my mom always says that (laughs) my my parents say this all the time they're just like 
we sent you to Korean school for 10 years oh, and you're like so not funny. fluent enough. And I'm just like, <laughs> like when you force your child to learn a language, <laughs> it's not going to come out as great as you think it is. Yeah. <laughs> exactly and it needs to be like spoken all the time like uh, you know otherwise you you just kind of forget it yeah 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 definitely (laughs) and I just I just love how uh the aunties are like speak in English your your Mandarin is so bad that you're giving me a headache (laughs) and it's it's just like wow yeah one of my aunties she she gets actually really annoyed when I try to speak Mandarin so she was just like oh just just speak in Indonesian or something you know it's <laughs> it's humiliating like hearing you speak Mandarin I mean if, if you think about it it's like your your aunties your parents are you know multilingual they can speak three mm-hmm. languages they can get by yeah. but then like people like us were just like no nah, yeah. like <laughs> like we're, yeah. we're stuck with like maybe one and a half and that's yeah. not really going to do us much good abroad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So Dial A for Aunties made news earlier this year because it's got picked up before it even published to be a Netflix. Was it a series or movie? Uh, it's a movie. Wow. And I got to say, reading through the book, I'm just imagining how it will look on the screen. And I'm very excited not only to see the aunties realized in, in 3D, but also just all the twists. Because, man, they're like mm-hmm. the last like third of the book alone had like a bajillion twists. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm so excited. Yeah. Like, how did that deal come along? Um, we're actually still not sure because <laughs> my agent had, yeah, she had just submitted it to publishers. And then she started getting calls from uh, film people and she would ask them, like, how did you hear of this? You know, or how, how did you get it? Uh, because I haven't sent it to anyone outside of like book industry. And they would be like, oh, we cannot reveal our sources. <laughs> so, so we have no idea um, who to thank, I guess, uh, for, you know, passing out the manuscript. And and so then after that, things kind of happened really quickly. Uh, I signed with a film agent and then she she got me like meetings with all these uh, production companies. And and then it came to like an auction with uh, four big studios. And I, I was a I was a complete mess. Like I, I was just not <laughs> sleeping the whole time. <laughs> It's like its own mystery too. Yeah. <laughs> I can I yeah. can shed a little bit of light on that mystery. So I was an mm-hmm. intern for Fox Literary and pretty much like what they did was um they would find manuscripts or mm-hmm. news in like the newspaper and then they would uh say like okay is this adaptable for movie or TV? Mm-hmm. And if it is then they start making the calls but Uh, My job as an intern was to look at the book deals that just Uh got signed and be like, okay, is this is this good enough to be a movie? Yes. So like write it down and then give it to Mm -hmm. give it to your superior. And then that's when they like start asking for manuscripts. You could totally edit this out, Marvin, because (laughs) this is not related to the book or interview. I'm just saying. We're we're solving the mystery right now. I'm just saying that some some intern some intern out there (laughs) was in charge of looking at the database of incoming books and they read the premise of your book, Mm -hmm. like Jane the Virgin. Mm -hmm. But with Asians, Uh there is a crazy rich (laughs) Asians wedding. Plus, there is like a body. It's like, okay, yeah. Plus aunties. Plus, yeah. Yeah, triggered by the aunties probably. I mean, accidentally killing a blind date too. Yeah, let's let's add that in there. This sounds like (laughs) a lot of things. (laughs) Oh, wow. That's so awesome. I love that. Thank you so much for the insight. <laughs> yes. We've, we've solved the mystery. Thank you. Solve Thank you, mystery. unnamed intern, for finding Dali Bronte's in yeah. the publishing news. <laughs> <laughs> but this this book, the the story just kind of goes off the rails. I was like, while I was reading it, I was like, oh my God, like what's what's gonna happen? This is so unpredictable. I'm so I'm usually very good at guessing what the story beats are going to be, but you just kept mm-hmm. surprising me with each chapter. And I'm like, 
oh, no, no, no. Like, you thought that they were going to get rid of this body. No, they're bringing it back inside the hotel. And it's just like, there's so, <laughs> much, there's so much back and forth. And but at the same time, like you have you have a corpse and it's grisly. And um, I just want to I just because there are dark aspects to how this person died. And mm-hmm. I'm just curious as to like, was it hard balancing the humor with like the actual mystery beats with like, OK, how are they going to like get the body out? How are they going to like avoid this um, this challenge, this conflict? Um, or did, did you just have like so much fun writing like the humorous parts that you were like, OK, well, I guess I have to <laughs> add in some like mystery part here because <laughs> that's what I promised. Right. It's like what came first, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. What, that. what came uh, first? <laughs> um, so that's actually a really great question because, uh, you know, you remember how I wrote so many books. Um, before I got a single one published. So a lot of those books were actually um, suspense thrillers because like you, I I really love like murder and reading about them and whatever. Um, But I I would try to write these books and then a lot of my critique partners, they would be like, oh, you're, you know, you're too flippant about murder. Like why are the characters so like blase about it, you know? And you need to make it, um, more serious and etc which was which was very very legit and and so then when I wrote Dal A for aunties and I got to do the humor it just came so naturally like oh thank goodness you know I don't have to uh you know like take it too seriously so so I think the magic was having Medi be the one who does take it seriously and is like, oh my God, you know, it's a dead body. Um, but then having the aunties be like the the ones who are so flippant and who are just so like, you know, oh, why didn't you get the glad bags? Like, you know, I think that was a really nice balance there. And um, yeah, I, I just, that that came so, so naturally. Like, of course it would be funny. <laughs> I mean, I was just thinking about like how Asian families would have time to squabble as they were getting rid of. Oh yeah, body. totally. Like <laughs> yeah, the bickering and never nothing stops. Nothing would stop them. Yeah, everything is a competition among Asian siblings. So it's just like, oh god, yeah, you didn't do this right. You didn't get the yes. right trash bag. Like <laughs> that's what you get for being a, a cheapskate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was actually something that uh, I remember my mom and my aunt who is uh, who lives in San Gabriel actually uh, having an argument about that I, I they were not getting rid of a dead body just to uh, put it out Clarify. there um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I do remember like you know my aunt being like why did you get like the generic brand why did you get glad like you know glad never tears <laughs> I mean it made me wonder if you know, if I killed someone, I'm not going to. But if I did, <laughs> would sure. would my family help me with the body hiding? Probably not. Um, <laughs> uh, I I don't think they will. So I was uh, kind of envious that Medi had you know four very independent aunties who are just like <laughs> we're gonna get this done, and you know they, and it. It was a form of love that mm-hmm. I really envied because because <laughs> they're so meddlesome, but also like they mm-hmm. seem to be more understanding of, um, I guess, like Medi's want to be mm-hmm. something more. Um, I don't want to spoil anything for our listeners, but there's one conversation where Medi has uh, a conversation mm-hmm. about with her mom about like the family curse with all men mm-hmm. in their family, like being destined to leave them. And uh, mm-hmm. just how, you know, like Medi puts so much pressure on herself. She's like, I have mm-hmm. to be a wedding photographer for my family. I have to be with mm-hmm. my mom. I have to be with my aunties. Whereas like, Her mom is just like, no, like if this is not something that makes you happy, then you can do other Mm -hmm. things. It's fine. And I feel like that is so relatable because Mm -hmm. a lot of 
we we grow up hearing our parents say, I sacrificed so much for you. And um, Mm -hmm. it's like, you're being so (laughs) selfish. But in the Mm -hmm. end, it's, you know, like you you put so much of this internalized pressure on yourself because you Mm -hmm. grew up hearing all these things. But it's just like, no, your parents are actually saying, it's okay, do what you want. Yeah. And yeah. it's the same thing with you and your writing, right? When, you know, your mm-hmm. your parents are just like, writing, are you going to starve? Like, this yeah. is not the path for you. But they were supportive in the end. Yeah. <laughs> well, now you're getting a movie. So now they can show off their friends. That's true. Yeah. They, oh, yeah. they have bragging totally. rights. Totally. <laughs> well, um, you do have a sequel coming up. Are you already mm-hmm. in the works or are you still? Uh, it's finished. It's- oh, wow. I think it's just going into copy edits, uh, which is where they they kind of just tidy it up with like uh, you know making sure there are no like errors and everything. <laughs> so it's it's pretty much done. We have like a beautiful cover, which I can't wait to be able to reveal. Um, I can probably reveal that it is going to take place in England. So I'm very excited about that. Oh. Will there also be murder in this one? Um. Or you can't say. No. I mean, I feel like that would be a little bit much, you know, because like know, you have a character know, yeah. murder someone, and then and then yeah. the second book's like, oh no, I killed someone else again. Like that—that's a yeah. serial murderer <laughs> at that. Point. Yeah, 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 yeah. I I really I want it murder again, you know, because murder is so great um, in books. Uh, but, but I was really like, oh my gosh, you know, I I don't know how I would be able to pull that off. Um, like how many people are these women going to kill? <laughs> so <laughs> it's it's going in a, a different direction. Um, you know, also like uh breaking numerous laws, but but not not murder. <laughs> maybe maybe a heist, but, yeah. maybe a robbery here and there. <laughs> yeah, don't don't worry. It it is still um uh like a crime caper. <laughs> I think you're definitely paving a path for a new genre here. <laughs> where it's like crime <laughs> but make it funny <laughs> Com- yeah. crime crime comedy and, and romantic <laughs> <laughs> all right well um yeah as we wind down this interview um Rira, do you have any last questions for i don't have any uh last questions i just i just really want to say i had so much fun reading your book um i haven't read the obsession yet but as since I love murder so much, I <laughs> will definitely go read it. Um, I, I'm just like so grateful to have like a book that was so lighthearted, even though there was murder <laughs> in it. Because um, because like murder mysteries and murder books are definitely like my books of comfort, but they can mm-hmm. be a little bit much sometimes. So I'm really glad yeah. that uh, this was such a fun read and. Also, like we read a lot of books for this book club, obviously, and we Mm -hmm. try to diversify as much as we can. Um, But, you know, we're trying to get better with reading more uh, from Southeast Asian authors and uh, South Asian authors. So Mm -hmm. it's really nice that um, I got to see a bit more of Indonesian culture in your book uh, Mm -hmm. with like the tea ceremony. Like that's something that's very foreign to me, even as, even as an Asian person, look, you guys, Mm -hmm. we're not a monolith. (laughs) Like we, like we don't know each other's (laughs) cultures either. Um, So yeah, it was like, it was like a really nice experience for me. And I just want, I'm just like really grateful that I was able to read it. Sorry, that's not a question. Just, uh, (laughs) just compliments here. That's so nice. Thank you so much. That means a lot to me. Yeah, and same with me. You know, I, I resonated with. I enjoyed the the murder plot or the um the hiding the murder plot, but I especially enjoyed just like <laughs> like, like like I said, the representation of my hometown was very a pleasant surprise, and just your mastery at grasping the dynamics of Fonti culture is unparalleled. So I was very excited, and I've been recommending this book to all my friends who I know share. Uh, my my trauma with with Your aunties trauma. and family. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Jesse, congratulations on the launch of your book. Congratulations on all eight books that you have coming out in the next the next few <laughs> years. Congratulations on. Can't wait to learn more about um, the movie and just thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us all the way across the globe. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. Yeah. 
And that was our interview with Jessie Q. Sutanto. You can find her book, The Obsession and Dial A for Aunties in bookstores everywhere. And yeah, be on the lookout for the other six books that she has coming out in the next few years and the upcoming Netflix film version of Dial A for Aunties. Very excited for her future endeavors. Yeah, I'm really excited to see the screen adaptation of this because if you thought it was bonkers when you're reading it on the page, (laughs) imagine it on screen watching actual people pulling off these hijinks because I have some something. Yeah, yeah, I have some friends who just don't read. So I'm excited that they'll have their own version of this book to enjoy. And yeah, congrats to Jesse on on all her success. Um, But with that, um, Rira, why don't you remind us about what we're reading for the month of June? We are reading the sexy second chance romance novel Happy Endings by Tian Kim Lam. Yeah, it's a uh, it's like for you, it's a sexy <laughs> book about a um, sex toy business owner. Yeah, it's her- about a Vietnamese American woman who has like a a sex toy adult store business, and her parents disapprove. And she has an ex who runs a nearby business. So second chance romance there. Uh, it sounds really fun. Uh, we have some fun guests that are going to be on that discussion episode yeah this is going to be a collaboration episode with my other podcast i do a pop culture podcast called good pop and both of my co-hosts han and jess are both big romance novel fans so um join us as we all send ourselves to horny jail uh, at the end of the month it's gonna be fun it's gonna be great <laughs> And with that, that'll do it for this episode of Books and Boba. Thanks again to Jesse Q. Sutanto for chatting with us. And a big thank you to all of our listeners for joining us once again. We'll see you next time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Rira Yu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about The Collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. (sighs) Kathy? Kim? Steve? Where have you been? We haven't seen you for seven years. Has it been that long? Uh Uh-huh. Oh. Uh, I was on a fishing boat. Training. It's part of the plan. What training? What plan? The the third season of the Korean Drama Podcast! Okay, we're doing this again? Okay, but there's no body switching in this one, right? No! The only thing we're switching is the fact that we're going to watch a good drama this time. From 2020, called Itaewon Class! A story about starting a restaurant and a dish that Koreans love called revenge. I thought you were gonna say kimchi jjigae. I thought you were gonna say juke. Those two. Koreans love those two. Listen to the Korean Drama Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. Part of the Potluck Podcast Collective. <laughs>